Back in college, I took a course on journalism, and when we were taught the basics of journalism, we were taught the questions that we should always ask when preparing a story. Those questions were who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those questions uh, can lead a story out of someone, and so if you're talking to someone else and you want to learn something about someone, you might ask those series of questions as well. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? They really can apply to any kind of interview, both formally and informally, if you're trying to learn about someone's plans for their life. So imagine if I were sitting down with one of our young people who had just graduated from high school and was getting ready to go off to college, and I would ask them those questions about their future plans. I would know who they are, so I would jump right in and I would say, well, what do you want to be in your future career? And the person might respond by saying, well, I plan to be a philosopher. I'm going to pursue a degree in philosophy. And so that would be the what. I would then ask, well, when? When do you plan to become a philosopher? And they would say, well, I will be a philosopher when I graduate. And I walk across the stage and I get my diploma that says I am now an authentic lover of wisdom, a philosopher. I then might ask the where question. Well, where will you go to get this degree in philosophy? And they would say, well, any of the fine upstanding institutions in our state or even in faraway places like Kentucky or Illinois in order to be a certified philosopher. I might say, well, well, why? Why have you chosen this path of becoming a philosopher? And they would say, well, I've always been told that I was a very wise person. I always knew I was great at philosophy. God has given me a wealth of wisdom, and I might as well be certified in it. And then I would get to the how question. I would say, based upon your pursuit of a degree in philosophy, how will it feel making french fries for the rest of your life? (laughs) Might be a good question. Depending upon what career path you want to take and what degree you might want to pursue, it might not work out exactly like you plan. But think about those questions. What, when, where, why, and how... But then it always comes back to who. Who are you and to whom do you belong? Really, the main questions of life have to do with our identity. So whether we're asking questions of ourselves or others about our future plans or the vocation that we're going to choose, the mate, the spouse, that we will be together for the rest of our lives, how we will invest our treasures and our talents, what we're doing in the near future and in the distant future. The main question to ask before anything else is who am I and to whom do I belong? There are questions having to do with identity. And so today in Colossians chapter 3, Paul goes into a whole list of descriptions of how a Christian ought to live their life. And he does that not only in Colossians chapter 3, but also in Colossians chapter 4. But before we can truly understand how we are to live our life, what we are to do, when we will do it, why we will do it, how we will do it, we first have to come to a grasp of understanding who we are and to whom we belong. And so Paul reminds us before anything else of our identity in Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, I'd like to take a close look with you today at these important verses that answer those questions. Who are you and to whom do you belong? As Paul is writing here to the church at Colossae, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, he's also directing his words to you and to me today as well. And he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That word since is a connection word. Meaning Paul now has taken what he's already laid out in Colossians 1 and 2, and he's building upon that. He's building upon the fact that we have an identity in Christ, that we've been chosen in Christ, we've been elected in Christ, we've been made Christ's own, that Christ is above all and over all and in all and through all. 
And now he says, since then you have been raised with Christ. The verb there that Paul uses has a past reality, but an ongoing effect. You have been raised. So something happened earlier, but intends to have an ongoing impact in your life. So what is Paul referring to? Well, when we dig deep into Paul's words and we explore not only what he's writing in this section, but also in the rest of his book of Colossians, and then as you're studying the Bible, you want to look at what else that same author has said in the other works that he's written, you see that Paul is using language of baptism. He's referring to you and to me being baptized into Christ and to entering into a personal relationship with Jesus through faith. And so the reality of this is that in baptism, you become clothed with Christ. And that means that when you are buried with Him in baptism, you die and are raised to life together with Him. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul had said this in chapter 2, verse 12. He says, you have been buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were raised with Him through your faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So the same language that Paul used in chapter 2, he now uses in chapter 3. And so what happens in your baptism is that a great exchange takes place. Now we know that the past event that Paul's referring to here is the death of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, some 2,000 years ago, died upon the cross, right? But what is the present reality? What is the ongoing effect of the death of Christ? Well, Christ Jesus died for my sins so that when I'm baptized into Him, and when I follow Him through faith, my death to sin is also His death, and His death is my death. So He died upon the cross for me so that my sin might be put to death, might be done away with, might be gone, might no longer rule over me. So the ongoing effect of Christ's death upon the cross is that sin is no longer your master. You belong to Jesus. The second thing that happened in the past is that Christ not only died upon the cross, but He rose again, buried in the ground, descended into hell, that on the third day He rose again, triumphant over death. And so the past event, Christ's resurrection, the enduring reality is that His resurrection becomes my new life as well. So because He is alive, I am alive too. Because He conquered death and hell, I conquer death and hell. Because He is victorious over Satan, I am victorious over Satan. And so what has Paul written about that reality in other places? Think about a place like Romans chapter 6, where it says, We were buried therefore with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, we also get to live a new life. Romans 6, verse 4. So I've referred to this before as an H2O of baptism. So that in the H2O, in the water of baptism, things go from being His to ours, right? His to ours. That Christ died, past event. What is the enduring present reality? I put my sin to death. Christ rose, past event. The present ongoing reality, I too get to live a new life. Things go from being His to ours in the H2O. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. What does Paul now say that we do because of that past event with enduring results? Set your hearts on things above where Christ is right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. Verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things things. So whether Paul uses the language of hearts or minds, he's saying the same thing. Heart and mind is both referring to your inner self being aligned with who you are and whose you are in Jesus Christ. And so Paul here in Colossians refers to things that are above. That's heavenly things. That is things that revolve around Jesus and His presence in your life. Things that are glorious and things that are good. And then he contrasts the heavenly things with earthly things. 
Not that Paul believes that things on earth are in and of themselves bad. No, we know that God created all things good in the beginning and they're for our benefit. And yet the things of this earth have been damaged by sin. And so earthly things refer to things that are evil and harmful for you compared to the things of Jesus which are glorious and are good for you. So the consequence of the changed future that you've been given, secured in Christ by the past event of His death and resurrection, that you have been guaranteed the ongoing result of a new life in Christ, what is the consequence of that changed future? That your present life will also be different. That the life you and I live in the present day will be different from people who don't have that assurance of Jesus in their life. Again, The what, the when, the where, the why, the how, they'll all come back to the who. Who am I? And to whom do I belong? That if I have a place in Jesus, then my life will be different. I saw this lived out in two different visits I made to India with my Indian friend, Pastor Raji. When I first went to India in the fall of 2013, I had an American passport. And when I went to customs, I faced questions. You know, where are you going? Who are you staying with? How long are you going to be here? But Pastor Raji was an Indian citizen. And so when he came up to customs, it seemed as if he flew right through because that was his land. Well, things changed between the fall of 2013 and the fall of 2015 because Pastor Raji became an American citizen. So last fall when we returned to India and I went up with my American passport, so did he. And so whereas he was used to just being able to walk right in, no questions asked, you see one Indian man at the customs desk staring at another Indian man and saying, you're American? Why are you here? Where are you going? What are you doing? How long will you be staying? And the difference was that his identity had changed. He was still the same person. He still looked the same. And yet his citizenship was no longer there. It was from another place. And so if our citizenship, as Paul says in Philippians, is in heaven, and we're waiting for Jesus to come again from there, that changes how we live in the present day. So Paul says, set your hearts and minds not on things of this earth, This is where you are presently, but where you belong. Set your hearts and minds on things above. So whereas people who live for this earth alone might be filled with revenge. They hurt me, I'm going to hurt them back. They talk smack about me, I'm going to talk smack about them. Jesus, when we fix our hearts and minds on Him, we're filled with forgiveness. Whereas the world may be filled with hate, with hearts and minds upon Christ, we can be filled with His love. Whereas the world is filled with despair, hearts and minds fixed on Christ can be filled with hope. Whereas the world is filled with arrogance, hearts and minds fixed on Christ, that we can have the gift of humility because our citizenship is in heaven. The consequence of a changed future is a changed present as well. So hearts and minds focused on Christ who is seated above, verse 3, then says, for you died. Now when did that happen? For you died. It's not talking about the future where we will all physically die and then stand before our Maker. But no, it's talking about a past event. For you died in the past. Again, the language brings us back to the fact that when we entered into a relationship with Christ in our baptism, we died with Him. We died to sin because He died for sin. And now what is the present reality? Look at what it says. And your life is now, now in the present day, hidden with Christ in God. So when God the Father looks at you as a person who's trusting in Jesus, who does He see? If your life is hidden with Christ in God, when God the Father looks upon you, He sees Jesus. So when you're praying to God, He sees Jesus. 
when you're calling out to God. He sees Jesus when you're needing God's forgiveness. He sees Jesus. He sees that Jesus is righteous and holy and His. It's His Son. And so through faith in Jesus, God looks at you and sees your life hidden with Christ in God. Who are you and to whom do you belong? My life is now hidden with Christ. That means in the present day, You are already a possessor of eternal life. You possess eternal life. And even though that eternal life is not yet fully revealed, it is already yours. And that should make a difference on how you live your life. All of the what's, the when's, the where's, the why's, the how's come back to the who. Who are you? To whom do you belong? If you think about Jesus' story in Luke chapter 12 today, he told the story about a man who really struck it rich. The man was a rich person. Boy, he had it good, didn't he? The man's ground uh, yielded an abundant harvest, and he didn't know what to do with all that he was given. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? I don't know what to do with all that I've been given. And this man, as the story is told, did not have his identity in Christ. And so where was his focus? If his identity was not in Christ, his heart and mind was not set on things above, but his heart and his mind were set on earthly things. And so he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my old barns, and I'm going to just build bigger ones. And I'll store up all this stuff for myself, and I'll eat, and I'll drink, and I'll be merry." And yet God comes to him and says, you're a fool. You're a fool because this very night your life could be stripped away and then who's going to enjoy what you've stored up for yourself? You see, that's the life that is not in Christ. The focus is all about me. But Jesus says that there is something different about those who are rich toward God. For those whose hearts and their minds are focused upon Christ, they're not thinking about what can I do for myself, but how can I invest my wealth to reflect that I am in Christ and my life is not my own. So think about it. What will I do with my resources? When will I do it? Where will I invest them? Why will I do this? How will this work for me? It's completely different if the answers to the who questions are different. If I am in Christ and if I belong to Him, everything changes because my life is a reflection of Jesus. Now, already that is the case. And yet verse number 4 of Colossians 2 says, yet when Christ who is your life appears, future, when He appears, then you also will appear future with Him in glory. So the now I already belong to Christ, but then... I will fully be known as I am known already by the Father. So how will my future identity in Jesus Christ change the way I live my life today? It all goes back to this. Who is your life? Who is your life? And if your life is not your own, but your life is Christ's, and you don't belong to yourself, you don't belong to this world, but you belong to heaven and you belong to Jesus, then all of the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions all will come back to that. I am not my own, but I belong to Him. So friends, may our identity be found in Jesus Christ. That no matter our vocation, our plans for the future, the relationships we live in, how we invest of what we've been given, that everything would come back to who we are and whose we are in Jesus Christ. So who are you? And to whom do you belong? When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory.